Will you please welcome Dr. Oz Guinness. Thank you, Tony. Thank you all. It's a tremendous privilege and delight to be back in Sydney and to be here at Moore College tonight. I have a great admiration for Moore College and the way it stood for faithfulness and orthodoxy in a time when there's so much compromise and appeasement around the Christian world. I actually, to be honest, sort of misunderstood the audience tonight. I thought we were going to have a friendly group of Moore College students. <laughs> Didn't imagine such a large and distinguished crowd. And I wanted to put together parts of two things I've been working on that might sound like oil and water, but we'll have to see. But I want to address the topic of freedom, because my conviction is that although many in the church at the moment are on the back foot, we're defensive and attacked for this, that, and the other, and many Christians are discouraged and beleaguered, I think actually if we think through the implications of the gospel and the teaching of scripture, you see that we should be on the front foot. We have the highest views of human dignity and all sorts of things, strong views of truth and so on. And among the many things for which we stand, one of them is certainly freedom and our desire to work towards societies, communities that are rich in human dignity, peaceful, stable, and give a solid place for freedom and justice. So that's my concern tonight, and I hope it'll make some sense. I was born in China. I was actually born in one of the dynastic capitals, and then after World War II lived in another one. But the part that I remember growing up was in what was then Nanking, now Nanjing. It had been brutalized by the rape of Nanking in 1937-38. It had suffered terrible depredations in the war, and it was threatened by the looming army of Lin Bao and the communist troops. But you could still see the greatness of Nanking. Because in 1500, it was the capital of the Ming Dynasty, which was the most powerful, prosperous, nation on earth. They'd sent a fleet, ships four times the size of Columbus's to East Africa, 75 years before Columbus set sail. And you could see they sent a million men to build what we know as the forbidden city the, uh, in Beijing. No one in their right mind in 1500 would have considered that what they saw as a cultural backwater off the western landmass of Asia would rival them, let alone eclipse them and dominate them. But of course, that's what happened. And for 500 years, they smarted under the influence of first Europe and then the West. But when they regained their power, there were a whole number of discussions across China as to what happened. And in one of the famous ones in the Chinese Academy of the Social Sciences, they raised the question, what happened? How could China have been dominated by Europe and then the West? No, they said it wasn't guns. It wasn't even the economy, although that was part of the reason. It wasn't so much the rule of law, although that was part of the reason. And at the end of the day, they concluded it was Western religion. In other words, the Christian faith. But Jewish scholars jumped into the discussion then, commenting on it. That was accurate, but not precise. Because anyone thinking could realize that the Christian faith, the church, had dominated Europe since 380 when the Emperor Theodosius declared Rome Christian, but it never dominated the world. What was it in the 16th century that was so powerful? And the Jewish scholars point out, it was actually the movement which had rediscovered Judaism in the Old Testament, namely 
the Reformation. The Reformation. And in many ways, the Reformation provides the master story, or rather Exodus through the Reformation, the master story of Western freedom. Now, I realize tonight that Australia, like Canada, like England and Britain at large, and in fact, all our English-speaking countries except the United States, is only half shaped by the Reformation, whereas the United States is decisively shaped by the Reformation. But remembering that strong difference, I want to show how the Reformation did that. Now, last year, of course, was the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. I'm sure you did much better here in Sydney with the leadership of Moore College, but in parts of America where I was, there was almost no celebration. And what celebration there was, was the celebration only the impact on the church, the rediscovery of the gospel, of justification by faith, the restoration of the authority of the scripture, and so on. Whereas there was no corresponding discussion and celebration of the impact of the Reformation on modern culture. Because historians would argue that the Reformation is the single strongest set of ideas that has made the modern world, although though in many ways that the reformers might not recognize. Why is that? Well, you can think of what are called the big C's. Now, I would just mention three of them. Calling. Think of Max Weber's argument that calling is behind capitalism. Whether or not you agree with his details, I don't actually think it's right as he puts it out. Calling is undoubtedly part of what gave the Western world its purpose and dynamism and entrepreneurialism. Or a second obvious C is conscience. The early church gives the first references to religious freedom. The first one of all, Tertullian. The second one, Lactantius. And the significance of that is that he was the tutor to the Emperor Constantine and his son. So probably the Edict of Milan, which is not making Rome Christian, but arguing for toleration for the Christian faith, he's probably behind that. But you can see that the Christian minority strongly believed in a free God who required free worship of his people. But then sadly, and we needn't belabor it, the centuries in between lost that. And the rediscovery of freedom of conscience was through Thomas Howells and Roger Williams and William Penn and Isaac Bacchus and John Leland and people like that. And you can see that is a crucial impulse to the rise of human rights. But I'm interested in the third C tonight, not calling, not conscience, but covenant. Because covenant is one of the crucial secrets to the rise of American freedom, although in many ways it was half developed and never succeeded in the rest of the English speaking world. But let me concentrate how it went to America first. Think for a minute of the notion of covenantal politics. You go to Politics 101, almost inevitably you're introduced to the Greeks. And both the Greeks and the Romans saw things in terms of monarchy, aristocracy, democracy. We all know that. And each of these forms of government had an ideal form and a corrupt form. Monarchy corrupted to tyranny. Aristocracy corrupted oligarchy, oligarchy, and democracy corrupted into mob rule. And even the Greeks said the wheel turns, none of them stays the same forever. It's not that you choose it and that's your system forever. No, they are corrupted over time and they change, which people forget, including democracy. But 50 years or so ago, there was a new classification put out by a Jewish scholar called Daniel Elazar. He didn't look at governments like the Greeks did, but he looked at the founding of societies. And seen that way, there were a different three. 
You have organic societies, which are linked by blood and kinship. Take a Scottish clan or an African tribe. Many of those in history, but fewer in the modern world. The second type of society, by far the most common, hierarchical, linked by power, force, conquest, kingdoms very often, empires always hierarchical. And then the third type of society, covenantal, created by a free binding agreement of the people, of which the three main ones were the Jews, very obviously, Mount Sinai, the Swiss in their Articles of Confederation in 1291, and the Americans. And the American Constitution is actually a nationalized, secularized form of the Sinai Covenant. What was it that was distinctive about Sinai that made that difference through the Reformation? Well, obviously, there were other covenants apart from the biblical ones. The Hittites had their suzerainty treaties. Celtic societies were oath societies. Alexander the Great had his Corinthian League trying to bind together all the Hellenic peoples. But Sinai is distinctive. Now, of course, there are other covenants in the Bible. Take, say, the covenant with Noah and humanity or the covenant with Abraham and his family. But Sinai is quite distinctive, and there were three things about it that the Reformation picked up, which put its stamp through the Reformation on history. Now, Sinai has other distinctives. It was a covenant in which the Lord is a partner. It is a covenant in which all the people were involved. We think of Greece and Athens. Only 20% of the men in Athens were citizens who could vote. Not the 80%, not the women, not the children, and not the strangers. But the Sinai Covenant, the men, the women, the children, and as Moses says, those who were born there, and those who are as yet unborn, an intergenerational project. And unlike almost all the other covenants, it covered the whole of life. You can see most of the other covenants are relatively narrow between a suzerain king and a vassal king. And that was it. But this covers the whole of the people, farming, sex, worship, all sorts of things. But they weren't the distinctives which made the difference politically. It was three other things. First, at Sinai, you had freely chosen consent. Have you ever looked in Exodus and see that three times it says, all that the Lord says, we will do. It is not a theocracy. The first man to call it a theocracy was actually a Jew, trying to explain it to the Romans. But the rabbis did not see it as a theocracy. It was technically a nomocracy, the rule of law, but freely chosen consent. And that, politically, is the origin of the consent of the government. And as the rabbi says, even when the Lord of the universe offers something, he invites the people to buy into it and sign on to it. Freely chosen consent. Secondly, it was a morally binding pledge. A contract is legal and usually narrow. You don't want to be bound totally, but you think of the difference, say, between a marriage vow, till death do us to part, and better and worse, and richer and poorer and all that. It's an incredibly comprehensive vow. And so is the Sinai Covenant, a morally binding pledge that goes way beyond the narrow limits of a legal contract. But it was the third element that was very crucial, the mutual responsibility of all for all. Now, of course, we know it as the origin of the great saying, you love your neighbor as yourself. 
you think of the, the three musketeers, all for one, one for all. But thousands of years before that in France, every Jew responsible for every Jew, as they said, a solidarity of responsibility. One rabbi said, there wasn't one covenant, there was 600,000 covenants, as each person made a covenant to the Lord and each other. Another rabbi quickly answered, no, that's wrong. There were 600,000 times 600,000 as each person made that covenant to the Lord and to each other in a strongly binding sense. Mutual responsibility. And of course, it included the stranger. Now you look at Aristotle again by contrast. In the Greek system, at its highest, you cared, I'm quoting Aristotle, for people like us. The family looked after the family, the clan, the clan, the nation only for its own sort. And for the Greeks, those non-Greeks, as we know, were the barbarians, were there by, by, by the strange language they had, or whatever. Not for the Jews. Love your neighbor as yourself is said once. More than 30 times you have the care for the stranger. The stranger may not be in our image, in terms of language or race or whatever, but every stranger is in God's image and therefore is part of that mutual responsibility. Now that was very powerful down through history, and you can see that that was picked up by Calvin and by Zwingli and by Knox, and by Cromwell. Cromwell says the only direct parallel to what he was trying to do in the English Civil War was the Exodus. Now, of course, we all know he failed when he died. His son was inadequate, and the king came back. In other words, covenantalism in England was the lost cause. And that's how historians refer to it. But what was the lost cause in England jumped the Atlantic and became the winning cause. And those who left Cambridge and East Anglia and so on went to America. Covenantalism was at their heart. The Mayflower Compact was a covenant. The Sermon on the Arbella, which led to the foundation of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, was all about covenant. And covenant was not only in their churches, it was in their marriages, it was the heart of their townships. And the first American state, Massachusetts, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, John Adams, who wrote its constitution, says that it was a covenant. And then 100 years later, of course, what was a covenant and then a constitution, and the two words were almost synonymous, became the US Constitution, we the people. And the American Constitution is quite literally a nationalized, somewhat secularized form of the Sinai Covenant. Now, of course, you realize immediately that prior to the Reformation, the church was not covenantal. In other words, when the church dominated in 380, as historians put it, the church tended, whether it was witting or unwitting, who knows, tended to copy Greek ideas, supremely Aristotle, think of its influence on Catholic philosophy, Greek ideas and Roman institutions. And Rome, of course, was hierarchical under the Caesars. And the Catholic church became hierarchical under the Pope. Now you remember the most common statement about power in history is Lord Acton. All power tends to corrupt. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. And you know what he was talking about when he said that. He was a great champion of freedom. He was talking about his own church. He was against papal infallibility in 1870 and remarked famously, the cardinals came in as shepherds and went out as sheep. And his point was very simple. When you have hierarchical power and it is corrupted, power not only oppresses the weak, power corrupts the powerful. 
And when you have a church based on power, whether well, it's a numerical power like a modern megachurch or a whole hierarchical structure based on power, it is always vulnerable to the temptations of corruption and oppression. In other words, the church from 380 did not go to the scriptures for its sources of leadership and structural organization. It copied Rome. The Reformation tried to go to scripture. But you notice, compared with many evangelicals, they didn't just think that Exodus was a forerunner of my salvation, our salvation. In other words, personal salvation or kind of spiritual symbol of salvation. No, they saw it as a template with lessons of how we should structure ourselves today back in the 16th century. Now it's worth asking, as with any system of government, what are its pluses and minuses? You can look at monarchy, you can look at aristocracy, you can look at democracy and easily see they all have pluses, they all have minuses and you've got to lean against the minuses and reinforce the pluses. Democracy today, profoundly in trouble. People are confusing freedom and democracy. And democracy is extraordinarily fragile and doesn't necessarily reinforce freedom. That's another, that's another issue. But what then are the pluses and minuses of covenantalism? The greatest strength of covenantalism you can see in history it brings together faith and freedom. You can see this very clearly in Alexis de Tocqueville, who is the French commentator on America. He was a Catholic and a Frenchman, and he knew his own revolution, and you know what happened in the French Revolution. You had a hierarchical church, church and state, throne and altar, they were both in collusion with each other. They were both corrupt. They were both oppressive. And the revolution threw off both and created a very strict separation of church and state, which the French call laïcité. And you know the cry of the revolution. We will never be free until the last king is strangled with the, last, the guts of the last priest. A little gory, but you get the point. <laughs> now, it's not funny in the sense that I say this with sadness as a European. The major reason why Europe has created the most secular continents in human history, the major reason is the massive revulsion against oppressive state churches. The Reformation understood that. And Tocqueville understood that. And he sees that covenantalism, freely chosen consent, et cetera, et cetera, had brought together faith and freedom in a new way so that, as he said, in my country, France, those who loved religion fought liberty. And those who loved liberty fought religion. Sadly, that's where we are in many of our countries today, where he says, says what I see here in this new covenantal way of doing things is the spirit of religion, in his words, and the spirit of liberty go hand in hand. The great Irish statesman Edmund Burke made the same point before the British House of Commons. He was British, but he defended the American colonists, so of course were English too. But he said, you shouldn't have, talking to his fellow Englishman in Westminster, he said, you shouldn't have been surprised by their desire for freedom. Why, he said, they were the Protestants of Protestantism. They were the dissenters of dissent. And that notion of a covenantalism gave them a desire for freedom, which led to the American Revolution. That's the strength. What's the weakness? The great weakness of covenantalism, whether in a church or a marriage or a nation, is that humans don't keep their promises. In other words, the covenant is a promise between the Lord and his people. And we know well from the prophets. They betrayed their promise. They behaved like whores, lusting after other gods. So we can see not long between Exodus and judges.
no king in Israel, and everyone doing what was right in their own eyes. And you think that is the challenge of freedom, of course, of marriage too. Machiavelli mocks this. The prince doesn't bother with promises. What was his word yesterday may not be his word today or tomorrow. Whatever is his interest right now is all that matters. Promises mean nothing. Or you have great atheists like David Hume, who lives in Scotland, the land of the Covenanters. And you may know that the English word Whig, people in history of favor and freedom, comes from the Scottish word for Covenanters. They were originally Whigamores. But David Hume, as an atheist, says this is ridiculous because humans simply can't keep promises, so why bother with them? Now you can see how important that is in our own day. There's an incredible amount written about trust in, say, politics, trust in journalism, trust in business, trust in marriages, trust in family. It's broken down. There's no trust in much of our modern societies. Cynicism, suspicion, the hermeneutics of mistrust, and so on. Trust is broken. Why? We're not keeping our promises. I don't just mean big marriage vows. Every day we're making a promise, many of them a little, see you at 11 o'clock. You know, we make all sorts of intentions which are promises to the future. If we keep our word and we carry through on what we say, then we become trustworthy. We're predictable to other people and we can be trustworthy. Our word is our bond and so on. And you can see how the social capital of trust is built up. But that's the problem with covenantalism. The Lord keeps his, we don't. But there's a third part of it people look at and that is the greatest requirement of covenantalism, which is it has to be passed down from every generation to every new generation. Again, I've said several times this week in Australia, what did Moses say the night of the Passover? Hundreds of years of slavery. Tonight they're going free. Does he talk about freedom? No. Does he talk about the promised land of milk and honey and all that they long for? No. Does he brace them for the howling wilderness? No. He talks about what? children. You think of the Jewish Seder, the youngest child called on to ask the question, why is this night different from all other nights? It's that transmission passing on. And you can see both with faith and with freedom, always one generation from losing it all. And that's the challenge of covenantalism. It depends on people's word, their promises, and the trust that's built up and it needs to be transmitted and handed on. And you can see in many of our societies, whether it's parents to children or the lack of, say, public education of civic affairs or the disappearance of any sense of history. I was saying in Canberra, one of our professors came up and said in his classes, people in the current generation didn't even know who Stalin was. Oh my goodness. Where are we with our sense of history? And you have great historians like Neil Ferguson who point out the crisis of history in history departments, and so on and so on and so on. Covenantalism requires transmission, and there's an enormous breakdown of transmission in our modern societies. Now, as I said, that may be America, and today it's broken down. The rest of the English-speaking world, with one exception, Ireland, sadly the land of my fathers, was not shaped by the Reformation in Ireland. But England, Scotland, Wales, Canada, Australia, and other countries were shaped by the Reformation, but only partly. They didn't take it to that fullest extent. And yet today, while America is deeply divided, and you can see the deepest, America's more divided than at any moment since their civil war. And the deepest division in America is between those who still see American freedom coming from the American Revolution, decisively biblical, 
And those who are following ideas, and whether they're aware of it or not, like multiculturalism, political correctness, social constructionism, the sexual revolution, whether they're aware of it or not, it goes back to the French Revolution and the Enlightenment, and is very different. In America, you can see that divide very starkly. Now, in England, and I guess in Australia, I don't know your country well enough, you can see that liberal left, with ideas going back to the French Revolution, increasingly powerful. But of course, much of the English-speaking world, apart from America and Ireland, actually is closer to sort of organic ways. It's always been done this way, half shaped by the English Revolution and the Revolution, and half shaped by various things that have come down through Magna Carta, the Bill of Rights, and so on. But things which today need to be articulated very carefully, because those who are trying to undermine it are incredibly articulate about what they have in mind. So we need to think through freedom as never before. So let me shift and just talk about freedom in general. With any political society, these are very simple points, but you need to think of simple things to build up your own system. With any society, there are always three parts to establishing freedom. Winning it, ordering it, and sustaining it. Now, the Americans won their freedom through revolution. The English won their freedom, not through revolution, but through things like Magna Carta, the Bill of Rights, various things over the years which built up to what were called the ancient liberties of the English, which were very important, not quite as articulate and intentional and clear as, say, the American Revolution, but very, very important, and they've come down to Australia. So it's in your blood. Winning freedom's easy. Ordering freedom's actually a little harder. The real challenge is number three, sustaining it. Because freedom never, ever lasts forever. And sustaining it, of course, is our challenge. Is Australia as free as it used to be? Is England as free as it used to be? Clearly, in many areas, no. The challenge is to sustain freedom, and that third task needs to be thought through. The second thing to think about, if you're thinking generally, is to remember the classical understanding of the menaces to freedom. You can read Plato, Aristotle, Cicero, many others, and they are very clear as to how freedom gets undermined. And we should be aware of what they thought were the menaces to make sure that we resist them. But many people don't give a hang for history, so they don't understand the menaces. Well, again, they're very simple three. One obvious one is a nation suddenly finds itself with external enemies that do it in. Now, with a tiny nation, take, say, the island of Singapore, how are they going to fight off the Chinese? Impossible. All that a small nation can do is to be vigilant and to be armed. And the Greeks strongly stress that point of vigilance and preparedness because of external menaces to freedom. The second menace to freedom, classically, was what they called the corruption of customs. You can see this very clearly in the Greek historian Polybius, who happened to be there in the siege of Carthage in 146 and was standing right next to Scipio Africanus, the victor. And if you know the story of the siege of Carthage, which had fought Rome for so long, Scipio was under orders to burn it to the ground and then supposedly sow salt in it. He didn't agree with the orders because he thought it better to leave Carthage standing to brace the Romans in contrast, but he had to do it. And as the flames licked up, he was seen to be weeping. And people thought, how strange that a Roman general would weep. And they thought it was maybe because he thought the orders were wrong. No, no, he said. I'm looking into these flames today, and I know that one day people will do the same to Rome. 
And Polybius says, how extraordinary that a conqueror on the greatest triumph of his life should see the mortality of fame and power. And Polybius says the great menace to freedom is what he calls the corruption of customs. And as he outlines it, every nation has its own constitution. If it's good, the nation does well. But he says the best constitutions rest in a bedding of customs, traditions, mores, cultural standards. And if you corrupt those, the best system of laws and constitution in the world will not hold things together. A corruption of customs. And he warns, you corrupt customs most when you're at the pinnacle of power or the height of prosperity. People grow complacent. There's a lot of complacency in Australia. You're the one English-speaking country with no recent recession, and so on. Anyway, the third classical menace is in one word, time. Time. Everything falls in time. I was saying this morning, historians say that if you take the history of civilization, 10,000 years or so, and pack it into an hour, free societies only come in in the last five minutes. Free societies are very rare and fleeting. Time. And you can see the American framers were aware of that. Abraham Lincoln, at the age of 28, he was incredibly aware of that. He calls it the silent artillery of time. But modern people, when time is moving faster than ever, somehow pretend it's always going to be like it is now, which is absolute folly. The speed of change today the injuries of time are happening faster than ever, and yet somehow we believe everything will be the same forever. Anyway, there are the classical menaces of time. So, to move on to a third point about the general thing, the challenge is how do you hope to sustain freedom? That's the challenge. You can win it, you can order it, but how do you hope to sustain freedom so that freedom truly can last forever? Can it? Very few people have had a crack at it. A lot of people think that by law, constitution, regulations, you can do it. No, you can't. The great French theorist Montesquieu argued that law provides the structures, and that's important to freedom, law, constitution, regulations. But you need the spirit of freedom just as well as the structures of freedom, what his disciple Tocqueville called the habits of the heart. It's got to come down from parents to their children, from teachers to their students. So it's second nature. The love of freedom and knowing how to live with freedom is a habit of the heart, the spirit of freedom. And if that goes, you're sunk. The best proposal to overcome this challenge of sustaining is actually the American founders. They didn't give a name to it. I call it the golden triangle of freedom. But if you read their writings, there were three things they stressed constantly and worth understanding to see if they apply more widely. Free, they had, think of a triangle with its three legs. Freedom requires virtue. Virtue requires faith of some sort. Faith of any sort requires freedom. And if you think of the recycling triangle, it goes round and round and round and round. Faith, sorry, freedom requires virtue, which requires faith, which requires freedom, which requires virtue. And if you've gone, each of those legs was strongly stressed by the American founders, and each of the three has been abandoned by America today. And American freedom, quite simply, is not sustainable. Now we can look at them with superiority. How do Australians hope that they're going to sustain freedom over the generations? Do you think you can undercut the Christian roots of so much in Australia and the flowers will live forever? Yours is increasingly a cut flower civilization. And cut flowers don't last like perennials in the ground. There's a, there's a relentless logic to some of these things that needs to be considered very seriously.
And we who care for freedom and care for justice and care for dignity need to explore these things to understand them so that when we go out into the public square, we can argue for things which are faithful to the scriptures, but also profoundly important for human society. And the search today is for human communities that have dignity and freedom and justice and shalom and peace and stability. And we're agents of that in God's world. Now, I don't want to go on much longer than that, but let me just finish with this thought. Tocqueville, whom I mentioned earlier, all his life was comparing the American Revolution, which he admired, but with a good deal of criticism. And the Americans like the admiration, and they forget the criticism very often. He was the one who warned, for example, of the tyranny of the majority and other things. Anyway, he admired the American Revolution certainly more than the French Revolution. He compared them. He was a disappointed lover of his own country's revolution. But at the end of his life, he made this famous remark. With a revolution, as with a novel, the hardest part to invent is the ending. And you can see many people have started well with tremendous ideals or considerable achievements. But it's the course of what they start over time that is the real challenge. So we can look at our Western civilization and thank God for the Greek contributions, thank God for the Roman contributions. We can thank God for the biblical contributions, the uniqueness of human dignity, the essential place of freedom, the importance of a very different view of justice, all sorts of things. Equality, there'd be no equality apart from equality before God and French style equality is an absolute disaster. You, we can thank God for the roots of many of these things but they won't last forever. And if I understand Australia right, you are at a very pivotal moment. But we shouldn't be on the back foot. The gospel is good news. It is the best news ever. And in the scriptures, we have answers to many of these huge challenges, but we've got to make them our own. And then by God's grace, with courage and with confidence, move out and argue persuasively, all the while living these things within our own communities. No other faith, religion, philosophy, worldview has a grounding for freedom. Go back to the Mesopotamians, Assyria, Babylon, all in the stars. Many of you know much better your Greeks. Look at the Greek tragedians, Aeschylus, Sophocles, and so on. Fate, fate, fate. But equally, any of you know the new atheists. There isn't a single serious atheist philosopher who can give you the grounds for freedom. Naturalistic science simply can't. You have books like Sam Harris's which say that freedom is a fiction. There are literally, in this case, no other grounds except the scripture. Sovereign God has made significant humans in his image. And we are the guardians of some of these things. And this is an hour for courage and confidence and moving out for the Lord's sake, but also for our neighbors. Over to you for whatever discussion we like. <laughs>